Welcome, Shoddy Stands. I have an important announcement to make. I'm sorry. Please don't get mad at me, but we need to talk about Ben Shapiro again, and we need to talk about systemic racism again. And I know, I know what you're going to say. Didn't you just do like an hour long video about systemic racism? And haven't you already done another hour long video about Ben Shapiro specifically? Well, first of all, like and subscribe. Also, here's the thing. Ben Shapiro just had an extended conversation about race on the Joe Rogan podcast, and it's weirdly kind of like his unintentional response to our last video about this topic. And so the Some More News team, which at this point honestly is just mainly my new wife, Mr. Maskey and I, just couldn't resist diving into his continued weird, unnecessary lies and tortured logic just a little bit. It felt like a, a good opportunity to put some of our own claims to the test, you know? Like, is Ben Shapiro a liar liar whose long shorts are on fire? And who knows, you know, maybe we'll learn something new along the way. That could, that, that could be fun, right? The other reason is that it seems like maybe, perhaps, possibly, Joe Rogan watched our episode on systemic racism. Now, we're not sure, probably not. It's just this conversation happened about a week after our video came out, and in this discussion, Joe Rogan actually pushes back against some of Ben's assertions by kind of summarizing it, which makes with some pretty interesting and some pretty revealing results. And frankly, this might be the closest we are ever going to be able to get when it comes to confronting Ben on these issues ourselves. You know, ben and I like to keep our band practices politics free. So in this instance, Joe Rogan will be serving as our admittedly very, very, very imperfect avatar. And yet somehow it is precisely this fact that allows Ben to let his guard down a bit. I guess he, you know, thought, thought he was in a safe space. And so it gives us a rare glimpse of what it's like when Ben actually gets some legitimate pushback to his nonsense. So let's dive in. But first, a trigger warning. This episode will contain some disgusting racist ideas and this guy talking out loud with sounds from his mouth. You have been warned. The biggest problem right now on the racism point is the shifting definition of racism. Ah yes, definitions, Ben Shapiro's strong suit. Ben Shakespeare, the famous wordsmith. All of a the sudden, these sneaky smugglers are shiftily shifting the definition of racism. It is so unfair to me. And the way I define racism is probably the same way you define racism. You believe in the inferiority or superiority of a group based on race, of an individual based on their membership in that group too, right? That would be racism. That's I racist. believe that you're inferior yes. or you're superior based on your race. End of story, right? That's, that's, racism. that's racism. So Robin DiAngelo and Ibram Kendi redefine racism to mean any societal structure that results in a racial inequality is itself racist. It's worth pointing out that the word racism is actually a pretty recent word. It doesn't show up in the English language until the early 20th century and wasn't widely used until about the 1940s. And this makes sense if you think about it because it was around this time that the first racist person was born, John Cornelius Racism. And as we all know, there was no racism before the early 20th century. But I'm being insensitive, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm a sarcastic news dude, you know, it's just what I do. It's clear that Ben is very mad that his definition isn't the same one everyone else is suddenly using. Maybe we can calm Ben down a bit if we reveal to him that these discussions and debates about the definition of racism and that the impact of policies and practices and structures and systems and institutions should be included in that definition are not a new thing. Here's what Beverly Daniel Tatum, author of Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria, had to say about defining racism. Racism, like other forms of oppression, is not only a personal ideology based on racial prejudice, but a system involving cultural messages and institutional policies and practices. This was published in 1997, when Ben Shapiro was just a very special 13-year-old boy with dreams of making it big in Hollywood. In his book, Portraits of White Racism, David Wellman defines racism as a system of advantage based on race. This book was published in 1977, before Ben was even a baby nut, which is to say a sperm in his dad's nuts. 
In their book Black Power, The Politics of Liberation, Stokely Carmichael, later known as Kwame Ture, and Charles V. Hamilton argue that there are actually two types of racism, individual racism and institutional racism, and that institutional racism originates in the operation of established and respected forces in the society, and thus receives far less public condemnation than individual racism. Funny, that's... <laughs> That's what you do, Ben! It's almost like Kwame Ture predicted your existence in 1967, before he changed his name. I'm sorry if you feel like you've had the rug pulled out from under you, Ben, but the fact is, language literally evolves. And I know it's kind of annoying that you can't tell whether or not I mean that literally or figuratively, since they now literally mean the same thing, but I imagine the thing that really irks you is that now even the Merriam-Webster's Dictionary doesn't solely define racism as the beliefs of individuals, but also as a political or social system founded on racism. And maybe this is why you are so very mad about the 1619 Project, a series of essays published in the New York Times Magazine with the goal of re-examining the legacy of slavery in the United States. The basic argument is the United States was not founded in 1776 with the principles of the Declaration of Independence. The, the country was actually founded in 1619 with the importation of African slaves to American shores because that's when the first African slave arrived in the United States was 1619. So the idea is that the entire history of America is a history of a system that is endemically white supremacist and that all of the Declaration of Independence is basically a lie, that the principles of all men are created equal. That was a lie when it was written and it's a lie now, that the idea that we have rights that preexist government, that's a lie. All of these things are lies. The Constitution was built in order to enshrine white supremacy. Okay, so a lot to unpack here. A few things. Um, you are aware that the Constitution explicitly states that enslaved black people who couldn't vote, had no rights, were separated from their families and beat, tortured, and killed, were to be counted as, quote, three-fifths of all other persons. Are you, you're aware of that, Ben. Like, maybe I'm alone here. But that sounds like enshrining white supremacy to me. His other critique, that it is inaccurate to say that the Declaration of Independence was a lie, well, yeah, it was, but not in the way that you appear to be disingenuously suggesting. You seem to be claiming that the 1619 Project rejects the principles set forth in the Declaration of Independence. It does not. It's just saying that our nation did not uphold those principles, which, um, it clearly didn't. In her essay entitled, Our Democracy's Founding Ideals Were False When They Were Written, Black Americans Have Fought to Make Them True, Nicole Hannah-Jones writes, the United States is a nation founded on both an ideal and a lie. Our Declaration of Independence, approved on July 4th, 1776, proclaims that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. But the white men who drafted those words did not believe them to be true for the hundreds of thousands of black people in their midst. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness did not apply to fully one-fifth of the country. I mean... That's true. Yes, it's the case that there were some founders who were opposed to slavery, but take a look at this famous painting of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, and now look at it with red dots on all of the enslavers. Kinda seems like a bunch of those people were lying when they said that all men are created equal. Maybe that's, maybe that's just me, you know? But what about you, Ben? What do you think is the real story of America? Now. The traditional notion of America is that America was founded in 1776, and that the story of America is that America did tolerate the great original sin of slavery up until the Civil War, and then tolerated Jim Crow up until the Civil Rights Movement of the 1960s. And that is a great stain and a blot on America. But the story of America is trying to fulfill the promises of the Declaration of Independence over time, make those promises available to everybody. And this isn't my argument. This is Martin Luther King Jr.'s argument when he talks on the, in the March in Washington about fulfilling the promissory note of the Declaration of Independence. He says, we're here to cash the check, right? You issued us the check, and then you didn't let black Americans be Americans. We're here to cash the check. Okay, so if I'm hearing this right, your disagreement with the argument that our founding democracy's ideals were false when they were written, and that black Americans have fought to make them true, is to acknowledge that, sure, America tolerated slavery and Jim Crow, and that is a stain and a blot on America, but that the real story of America is trying to fulfill the promises of the Declaration of Independence. So, 
How exactly are these two arguments different? You know, the only real difference I can see is the word black. Weird. Also weird that you cite Martin Luther King Jr., incidentally a black man, who fought to make the stated ideals of our nation true, as an example of someone who agrees with you. Maybe, maybe weird is not the right word. Now, I know that I like to kid around a lot on this showdy and portray the character of a disheveled and disgruntled news dude, but I mean this in all sincerity, Ben. I really think you should stop quoting Martin Luther King Jr. I think you should keep his name out of your filthy f***ing mouth. I think you should stop appropriating his words for your right-wing reactionary agenda because breaking news, MLK was a radical leftist. And that historic speech about the promissory note and blank check that you reference, I don't think you understand it. Because if you did, you would recognize that it's essentially the same argument that is being made in the 1619 Project. Because when King states, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. He is very obviously saying that our democracy's founding ideas were false when they were written. And when Nicole Hannah Jones talks about how black Americans have fought to make them true, she is talking about people like Martin Luther King. In other words, what the f are you talking about, man? The argument that you think you are making against the narrative of the 1619 Project is actually an argument in support of the 1619 Project. Ben, I am starting to think that you might be stupid or lying or both, probably both. And you seem to have a major problem understanding how history impacts the present. So the 1619 Project has essays blaming literally everything on racism. So disparities in maternal mortality between black women and white women, which by the way, exist in Europe and in Canada. That's due to American racism. Well, Ben, they don't actually have any reliable statistics on the maternal mortality rate of black people in comparison to white people in Canada. So that's just a lie or a terrible guess. And are you suggesting that racism doesn't also exist in the UK? But more importantly, the argument put forth in the 1619 Project is that myths about physical racial differences were used to justify slavery and are still believed by doctors today. This is true, and it is a major factor for the elevated levels of maternal mortality among black women in the US. Yet Ben continues with his grievances about the absurdity of the idea that our racist past could possibly impact our lives today. Traffic patterns in the United States is due to systematic American racism. So the essay that Ben is referencing here is called, What Does a Traffic Jam in Atlanta Have to Do with Segregation? Quite a lot. It is very obvious that the title of this essay, which is the only part of the essay Ben read, is specifically designed to make the reader think, well, how could something that seems so disconnected from our history of segregation actually be caused by that history? But instead of trying to understand that point by actually reading the essay, Ben decides to portray this concept as an utterly ridiculous idea. Yet the data, the history, and yes, the facts, which don't care about your feelings, Ben, are clear. Overtly racist policies that subsidize the suburbanization and homeownership of white families while explicitly denying black families this opportunity relegated them into the high traffic inner cities adjacent to highways and freeways, commonly known as ghettos, which, since we know how much Ben loves definitions, are defined as a quarter of a city in which members of a minority group live especially because of social, legal, or economic pressure. And the consequences of this, which Ben is mocking, aren't good. Studies have shown that black and Hispanic people disproportionately suffer from the severe health implications of air pollution at far higher rates than white people. And also, this residential segregation has consigned a large percentage of black people into areas of high pollution, concentrated poverty, and a lack of economic opportunity and healthy food options, which have also created a higher level of the health risks such as obesity and hypertension that coincide with higher levels of maternity mortality. It's almost like, this is all some sort of like a, it's like a, a system. It's, a, some, a, a, it's like a system that it, it involves race somehow. And it's definitely like, perhaps history matters. And Ben, 
It's almost like you didn't watch the episode we did called How to Pretend That Systemic Racism Doesn't Exist. You'd like it. You are one of the main characters. But it may be the case that Joe Rogan actually did watch that episode. So if we look at 1776 and we look at the Declaration of Independence and we look at America today in 2020, w w there clearly is some impact in the echoes of slavery and then after that, Jim Crow. There's clearly some impact in these deeply impoverished communities that don't seem to advance. Yes. So the, to, to, to make the argument about institutional racism, there, there's a couple ways you can read this. When people say systemic racism or institutional racism, I usually ask them to be a little more specific in what they mean because there are a few ways you can read that. One is history has impact. Of course, that's true, right? That's true for everybody. It's true in your family history. Right? If you have a grandfather who went to who went to prison on a particular charge that leads to poverty right. for your parents which led to more poverty for you right people have histories those histories are embedded in their life experiences and that's true for societies as well all of that is for sure true then there's the question as to whether the institutions today are racist and that's not quite the same thing right because history has consequences is not the same thing as saying the rules today are racist because the rules today are not racist, actually. The rules today are quite not racist. Okay, so we're pretty familiar with this trick from Ben by now. He creates a straw man definition of systemic racism that literally no one is making, claiming that the definition of systemic racism is explicitly and intentionally racist laws that exist today, while simultaneously minimizing the impact of history on racial inequality. But historically, it's fairly recent. If you go from the civil rights movement to 2020, we're really not talking about that much time. We're talking three about generations, 50 but plus years. 60 years, yeah. yeah I mean, it's it, 50 but plus. Ben really wants to make it seem like this all happened a really long time ago so that he can dismiss its impact as much as possible. Three generations, 60 years. By the way, here's a recent picture of Magic Johnson who just turned 60. Ben also seems to be forgetting about the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and the Supreme Court decision in 1967 that banned the outlaw of interracial marriage, which would make it 53 years, so actually 50 plus. By the way, the ban on interracial marriage wasn't amended in the Alabama Constitution until the year 2000. Just a fun little factoid for you. Also, for no particular reason, here's a picture of Daniel Smith. He's 88 years old. His father was enslaved. But yeah, Ben, this, oh God, this all happened. It happened such a long time ago. But Ben, if all the racist rules disappeared in the 1960s, why did we continue to see laws that outlawed racial discrimination in systems and institutions after this period? Laws like the Fair Housing Act of 1968, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act of 1974, the Housing Financial Discrimination Act enacted in 1977. By the way, here's a picture of actress Kerry Washington who happens to have been born in 1977. Congratulations on your recent Emmy nominations, K-Dub. It's because the definition of systemic racism is not explicitly and intentionally racist laws. In fact, Kendi's definition, who Ben was so mad about, is a lot more useful if your ultimate goal is to achieve racial equality. Under Kendi's definition, systemic racism is an array of racist policies, only a subset of which are explicitly racist laws. And a racist policy, or rule as Ben might say, is one that produces or perpetuates racial inequality. They can be written or unwritten, explicit or implicit, intentional or unintentional, conscious or unconscious. They can be quite limited or vast in their impact. They can take the form of habits, customs, or traditions. They can be held by individuals or groups, or by institutions, schools, school systems, churches, corporations, hospitals, libraries, local, state, or national governments, police departments, and other government agencies, the court system, the jail and prison system, etc. It can also take the form of the absence of policies that you don't enact. A good example of a racist policy that doesn't explicitly mention race at all is a new policy that our very racist president recently announced via tweet. I am happy to inform all of the people living their suburban lifestyle dream that you will no longer be bothered or financially hurt by having low income housing built in your neighborhood. Now, it's true, Trump didn't use the N word in this tweet, and I suppose it's impossible to know what is truly in his heart, but um, this is the guy that was sued by the federal government for violating the Fair Housing Act by the Nixon administration in 1973 because he wasn't letting black people move into his properties. 
And so while Rogan doesn't press Ben on his claim that the rules today are quite not racist, he does press him on the role of history and its impact on racial inequality today. In the world of, you know, in history. the vast span of human history, it's, it's not very a very small amount of time. Right. So clearly there's some impact of both racism Absolutely. and then Jim Crow laws. So that that's where I'm saying there's a middle ground. Yeah, and, and it's in dem it, it is important for people on my side of the aisle, conservatives, to acknowledge and recognize the importance of, of history in people's living situations now. And it's important for people on the other side of the aisle to at the same time not attribute every single thing to history. Because right. but people isn't there born always something like that. There's always like extremes on each position and the truth lies somewhere in the middle. Yeah, but I don't think that it lies as far in in the dead center of that as people I think want it to. Okay, so Ben is starting to make some important concessions here. He's acknowledging that history matters, not as much as a lot of people want it to apparently, you slippery weirdo, but you can start to see him getting backed into a corner here. How will he try to weasel his way out of it? Now, we already know this actually, he will try and claim. So what do you as an individual black person do to change your life? And I don't think it's helpful. And in fact, I think it's actually quite hurtful to spend an enormous amount of time talking about the legacy of discrimination and racism instead of talking about what can you do right now to fix your problem. But in this particular setting, where it's not a college student whose mic gets immediately cut off, we get to see Ben actually have to respond to sustained pushback. Now we're gonna play this next clip for a little bit longer than we normally do. Mostly because it's just, it's kind of fun to watch him squirm. The way to fight against that is to make good decisions. And so the, you fight against the system to make sure that the system has rules that apply equally to everyone. Right, but, but you clearly see that there's a big difference between people coming over here willingly and doing so in order to better their lives versus someone whose ancestors were dragged over here to be sold as property. Well, and then dealing with the repercussions of that being your family history and red line laws and all the other things that were put in place to sort of keep them in very specific areas, which to this day remain crime ridden, gang ridden, deeply impoverished communities. Well, that's true, but the question is how much of that is historic redlining and how much of that is an 18-year-old kid today deciding to pick up a gun and shoot somebody? But how much of that 18-year-old kid today deciding to pick up a gun and shoot somebody is based on him growing up in this fucked up environment where that's what he models, where everything around him is crime and gangs and you imitate your atmosphere, which is what all humans do. Right, but the answer is there's only one way to break that chain. What, what way is that? That way is to not pick up a gun and shoot somebody. I think that's that a simplistic way of looking at it if you're on the outside of that community and you're not one of those 18-year-old kids that grows up with the incredible influence of all the people around him and that's all you see and that's all you know. Well, but the problem is the only way that's going to be the thing that your kid doesn't know is for you not to do it. At some point, personal agency has to come in. Some, it does, because the, education, what's education and, and teaching them about personal agency and, and letting them understand that there's a way out of this and that the path that they see being replicated over and over again by these people that wind up dying young, that wind up going to jail, that there are other options. Oh, sorry. This was just... So entertaining. And it's a welcome distraction from um, glancing outside, I guess. By the way, I fully recognize that Joe Rogan's framing of this situation is far from ideal, but you have to admit that it is pretty interesting for Ben to think that his standard operating procedure is going to work, only to be persistently rebutted by the concept that our history of systemic racism impacts the available options for children growing up today. And it becomes a lot harder to make the case that the only way to address racial inequality is for individual black people to make better choices after you have just acknowledged that the range of their choices is limited by our history of racism and racist policies. Where will Ben go from here? I, I totally agree with this. And this is why I think the worst thing that you can say to a kid is you're born behind the eight ball and no matter what you do, you're not going to succeed. Yes. Okay, Joe Rogan, you're a little bit out of your depth here and starting to show your limitations. So we'll take this one. Ben, who exactly is telling black children that no matter what you do, you're not going to succeed? The only point that I'm making about the 1619 Project is mm -hmm. when you teach people that they are the victims of a society, it makes it very difficult for them to succeed. All right. I almost forgot, the 1619 Project is creating a victim mentality. 
So what are you suggesting, Ben? Are you saying we should lie to black children about our history? As Nicole Hannah-Jones recently stated in her response to Senator Tom Cotton, who was trying to ban the use of the 1619 Project in schools, and recently claimed that the founders rightly viewed slavery as a necessary evil upon which the union was built. Quote, Imagine thinking a non-divisive curriculum is one that tells black children the buying and selling of their ancestors, the rape, torture, and forced labor of their ancestors for profit was just a necessary evil for the creation of the noblest country the world has ever seen. In fact, the 1619 Project has specifically and intentionally placed black Americans at the center of the fight for democracy. Black children learning a narrative of American history through the framing of the 1619 Project would understand their ancestors to be heroes, to be people that persevered against all odds. In one of her essays, Jones states, our founding fathers may not have actually believed in the ideals they espoused, but black people did. Now, that sounds like some empowering shit right there, Ben. And like, maybe you're the one who's feeling disempowered. That sounds like some raw, raw America shit right there. To the point where it's actually... It's making this news dude a little bit queasy. It makes me almost want to start celebrating the 4th of July again. Almost! Ben, I know it's hard to face the truth about our founders, especially since you started dressing up as one when you were five years old. Also, what is with this obsession with what black children are taught? What about what, like, white children are taught? Because if we were to teach white kids that racism ended when Martin Luther King said, I have a dream in a nation with a 10 to 1 racial wealth gap, in a nation with so much racial inequality, well, Ibram X. Kendi can say it better than me. What post-racial ideas say to people, to everyday people, is basically racist policy no longer exists. And it says that to people in a nation of racial inequity, in a nation of, of racial segregation. And so then it causes the individual to be like, okay, why does all of these inequities and disparities exist? If it's not racist policy, if it's not racial terror, if, it, then it must be something wrong with a particular racial group. Right. What if... Instead, we taught white children, and in fact, children, empathy and compassion. And instead of prioritizing myth-making, we prioritized truth-telling. We might have the chance of living in a more equal nation. What do you think about that idea, Ben? What if we taught empathy? Empathy is not actually the best thing for politics. It actually almost deactivates the reasoning centers of your brain. Ah, okay, it's um all starting to come into focus. And it becomes more and more clear as Ben is pushed even further on the impact of history, on the status of black people's lives today, and the range of options that are available to them. But if your grandfather wasn't ahead, didn't get ahead, if your grandfather was in and out of jail, if your father was in and out of jail, everyone around you is like that. If there's literally no influence that's positive in your life, the idea of saying to a kid like that, hey, don't pick up a gun and shoot somebody, it's way, that's way too simplistic a version of, of their future, in my, in my, well, I mean, my I, opinion. The problem is I don't see an alternative solution. So at this point, essentially, Ben has completely acknowledged that our nation's history of racism has an immense impact on black people's lives today. But he very quickly pivots to, I don't see an alternative solution, perfect Ben impression. This is where he wanted to go a long time ago. And here's where we start to get to the heart of the matter, because, Obviously, there are tons of alternative solutions to the problems of racial inequality. And to his credit, our very, very, very imperfect avatar proposes some of those alternative solutions. I think an alternative solution is there has to be some sort of large scale intervention in these communities to do something about what 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 has already been set in motion and the momentum that keeps continuing decade after decade. That, that I don't know what could be done. Uh, well, but that, that's the problem is that I think that a lot of the solutions that have been proposed have already been tried. Meaning like that, for ex okay, so for example, LBJ thought that the way to alleviate a lot of these inequalities was the war on poverty. And he, he openly talked about this. He talked about, he gave a speech very famously in which he said, we're trying to guarantee equality of outcome, not just equality of opportunity, equality of outcome. And you can't hold the race where somebody is starting 20 yards behind mm -hmm. and then fire the gun and say, okay, then it's an equal race, right. right? So you have to get the person who's 20 yards behind to actually get up to the starting line so that they're equal. And so the idea was, we're going to fight this war on poverty and alleviate poverty largely through transfer payments and, and through the government taking a forcible step 
in favor of alleviating people's lives. Okay, first of all, Ben, you are using the word alleviate far too much. But thank you for your very accurate history lesson. And thank you for carting out the often used right-wing reactionary boogeyman, the horrific idea that the left doesn't just want equality of opportunity, but equality of outcome. <laughs> First of all, Ben likes to view the idea of equality of outcome as meaning that like everyone gets to go to Harvard Law, as opposed to the idea that maybe everyone should have basic necessities like food and shelter. But also, let's take a look at what LBJ actually said at the Howard University commencement address that Ben is directly referencing. In June of 1965, LBJ states, freedom is not enough. You do not wipe away the scars of centuries by saying, now you are free to go where you want and do as you desire and choose the leaders you please. You do not take a person who for years has been hobbled by chains and liberate him, bring him up to the starting line of a race and then say, you are free to compete with all the others and still justly believe that you have been completely fair. The race, like in, in the other episode we did, he went on to say, we seek not just freedom, but opportunity. We seek not just legal equity, but human ability. Not just equality as a right and a theory, but equality as a fact and equality as a result. And then immediately after this speech, President Lyndon Baines Johnson signed the Reparations Act of 1965, which used large transfer payments to level the playing field for every American. But it, it just didn't work. It was a total failure. I heard they spent all the free money they got on drugs. Wait, that... That didn't happen. Of course it didn't. What are these transfer payments that supposedly happened during Johnson's War on Poverty? The only reference we could find was an unsourced Wikipedia entry that came up when you Google the term equality of outcome and LBJ. Now, if you know what the hell he's talking about, and I mean this sincerely, Please comment and let us know. Is he talking about like welfare in general? Because that started in 1935 under FDR. Is he talking about tax breaks? We couldn't figure it out. And I don't want to smear Ben, but I'm fairly certain that he got this LBJ did transfer payments that didn't work out fact from, again, an unsourced Wikipedia entry that comes up when you Google the term equality of outcome and LBJ. And as Daniel Gray of The Atlantic writes, distracted by the Vietnam War, Johnson never followed up his stirring rhetoric at Howard with significant new policies. But in terms of what Johnson did do in the short time he was able to implement policies in his war on poverty and in pursuit of the great society were programs like Medicare and Medicaid and food stamps. The food stamp program, now known as SNAP, kept about 7.3 million people out of poverty in 2016. Today, Medicare provides health care for one in five Americans, and it would cover thousands more if the 13 remaining states who have decided to deny their most vulnerable citizens health care would simply opt into Medicaid expansion under the Affordable Care Act. Before Medicare came into existence, only about half of Americans over age 65 had health insurance. Now, just, just an idea but maybe we should do that for everybody. And as far as the impact that these policies had on racial equality, consider the fact that the racial wealth gap started decreasing dramatically after Johnson era policies took hold and only started increasing again when Nixon era policies came into effect and then significantly increased again when Ronald Reagan came into office, a person who demonized the role of government and racialized social services such as welfare and cut the funding for social security, Medicaid, food stamps, and federal education programs during his presidency. I now understand why you think that he was the greatest president of your lifetime, Ben. And this neoliberal ideology, an obsession with budget deficits, except when it comes to the military or tax cuts for the rich, of course, and the notion that poverty is a result of individual character flaws in order to justify massive cuts to the social safety net has become wholly adopted by the Republican Party. And many of the basic contours of this ideology, 
admittedly to a lesser extent, have become accepted premises to many in the Democratic Party as well. Consider the fact that former President Bill Clinton, rapist, signed the Personal Responsibilities and the Work Opportunity Act, love that name, Bill, personal response, God, it's great, which he bragged would end welfare as we have come to know it which greatly shrank the number of people who qualified for the program. And perhaps you remember the negotiations of the grand bargain under the Obama administration in 2011, when a large contingent of the Democratic Party agreed to historic cuts in the social safety net in exchange for an increase of taxes on the wealthy. And my point is, the war on poverty never really actually happened. And Ben's specific example literally did not happen. So Ben, are you lying, or stupid, or both? And are there any other possible solutions for addressing racial inequality that you want to lie about? This is not a money. This is not really a money problem. It really is not a money problem in just terms of you could sign everybody a check tomorrow, right? The, the predicate. So the the predicate for the slavery reparations movement is exactly this: sign everybody a eighty thousand dollar check and the problem will be alleviated. Okay, Ben, just a note, it's the same one. You are still using the word alleviate too much. I would recommend a thesaurus. You could use the words like lessened or relieved, assuaged. That's a good one, makes you sound smart. But also, shut the f up, you are full of shit. First of all, it doesn't matter whether or not reparations would alleviate racial inequality. If a debt is owed, it is owed. And it is definitely owed. Aren't you like the Game of Thrones dork who's like, uh, a Lannister always pays his debts unless it won't alleviate racial inequality. Second of all, your proclamation that this is not a money problem is completely ahistorical, very big surprise. We've actually tested this theory with white people. We subsidized the purchase of homes for white people. We provided free education for white people. We literally gave away 10% of all land in this country to white people. And so we actually know that literally giving free stuff to people increases their wealth, improves their lives and the lives of their descendants, which is frankly a pretty obvious concept. So what's the problem, Ben? What is what is so different about black people? The biggest obstacle to young black kids growing up in the inner city, again, is not history. It is in the moment. The drugs, the crime, the fact that there are no fathers in a lot of these areas. Roland Fryer, black professor at Harvard, he's done excellent work showing that actually the number one factor in allowing kids to, to rise is not even having a father in the home. It's how many fathers there are generally in a community. So here, Ben and I find a rare moment of tepid agreement. It is a major problem that we have a lack of male father figures in the black community, though I suspect that we might have a different understanding for the cause of this problem, and very different solutions to alleviate this problem. What is your solution, Ben? Let's simplify this if we can. Sure. If Ben Shapiro is the king of the world, how do you fix Baltimore? How do you fix Detroit? How do you fix the south side of Chicago? Okay, so here's the unpopular view, but it happens to be empirically correct. The first thing you have to do is you have to load the place with police. <laughs> ben, that's the exact wrong solution to the biggest problem plaguing black communities. In fact, that's the exact cause of the biggest problem plaguing black communities. For a little context, the US has less than 5% of the world's population, but 20% of the world's incarcerated people. In 2003, the Bureau of Justice Statistics estimated that black men have a one in three chance of going to federal or state prison in their lifetimes. Right now, black people are 12.7% of the population, but 38.2% of the prison population. And also, right now, nearly 40% of the US prison population, 576,000 people, are behind bars with no compelling public safety reason. And so if your main concern is public safety and making sure communities have male role models, the worst possible solution you would come up with is to load the place with police. Because studies have shown that when large numbers of parent-aged adults, especially men, cycle through stays in prison and jail at very high rates, communities are negatively affected in myriad ways, including damage to social networks, social relationships, and long-term life chances. These effects impair children, family functioning, mental and physical health, labor markets, and economic and political infrastructures. So what's really going on here, Ben? 
I think it might be worthwhile to examine one of the rare discussions Ben recently had with a person that has very different views from Ben, and with a bit more policy and historical literacy than Joe Rogan. A few months ago, Ben sat down with Ezra Klein, and he wasn't able to slip through his lies about the viability and efficacy of specific policies because he knew those arguments would get shut down. And so he finally had to admit what was really going on. Let me, let me ask you this question just straightforwardly. Sure. Why is it that if you are the head of a household, African-American household, and you have a job, full-time job, you're gonna have a lower net wealth on average than the head of a white household who is unemployed? Or similarly, if you're the head of an African-American household, you have a college degree. You're likely to have a lower net worth than a white household headed by somebody who dropped out of high school. That is speaking to something that has happened historically, right? Wealth, no is, an interge- right, is, because- wealth is an intergenerational transfer. Of course. At some point, if you want society to be even roughly equal, you're going to have to do something about that interracial injustice. Or alternatively, the idea of equality would be that everyone is treated equally under law, not differentially by race or based on past discrimination. That is one idea of equality. Well, this is correct. And this is why when you say why we're polarized and the Mm -hmm. implication is that we are polarized because of tribal identity. The real reason I think that we're polarized is because there are two very different visions of the world and how the government ought to operate in that world. This is very interesting, Ben. During this entire conversation that you've had with Joe Rogan, you have been claiming that racial equality can only be achieved by black people making better decisions. You've been arguing that alternative solutions that have been tried just didn't work on a measurable and factual level. But now that you can't get away with those um, lies, you are talking about some sort of ideology. What is this ideology? I do not think that society or government is in a place to achieve equality of outcome, nor do I think that the attempt to, but in Thomas Sowell's phrase, Wait. to achieve to achieve cosmic justice is something that when is you either say, possible when you say, or, or when desirable you say from the government. Achieve, when you say we can't achieve, I can totally, no, buy, can I can totally buy the presumably. argument that you don't want it to or that you think it would be unfair, but I think there's a very different, a very big difference that's important to keep in mind between cannot and should not. Interesting question, Ben. Do you think that the government cannot achieve racial equality, or do you believe that it should not try to achieve racial equality? And if it is should not try to achieve racial equality, why not? The founding argument, you know, for, for better or for worse, the founding argument, I think very much for better, is that there are certain individual rights that, were, that pre-exist governments, and the government was instituted to protect those individual rights, and that a government that surpasses those individual rights ceases to act in, in, as, a, as, a, as a function of of its original mandate and therefore is illegitimate. And so, I'm sorry we took so long to get here, but this is the main point. In fact, it's pretty much all you need to know about Ben Shapiro, because all the lies and misrepresentations that he spouts about facts all work in service of justifying his ideology, which he holds based on his feelings. It is maybe a little ironic that the person whose catchphrase is facts don't care about your feelings, embodies the exact opposite phenomenon. Because if you believe that a government that does anything beyond protecting individual rights is illegitimate, that doesn't leave a whole lot of room for the government, which is supposed to be responsible for, um, you know, uh, we the people, to do pretty much anything at all. It certainly doesn't allow for it to do anything meaningful about addressing racial inequality, which he has even admitted is at least in some measure due to historic injustice. And if you think I'm cherry picking, here's how Ben justifies his belief, his feeling, that a man and a woman do a better job of raising a child than a gay couple, despite the facts not supporting that belief. Okay, you have these religious principles. Is there any justification outside of the Bible says so for why this is correct? And as a religious person who's actually thought through his positions, I tend to believe there is. Like, I, I, so as that, a religious person, I yeah. believe that God didn't create stupid rules. So if you believe that God didn't create stupid rules, then you have to come up with some sort of justification for the rules that are being expressed. Right there, Ben is saying that since he believes in the Bible and has faith that God didn't create stupid rules, then he has to create his own justification outside of the Bible for why he's right. In other words, he's starting from a conclusion based on his feelings and then finding facts that support it. Holy fuck. look at that shiny, sexy setup we used to have. Oh, in the before times, when we used to film these episodes with an actual camera and other human people used to help us make the show and now I'm stuck with my awful wife, Mr. Maskey, who will not shut up about wearing her. Though we're, we're trying to work through it. 
More importantly, I think you can see the basic problem here. Whether Ben is working backwards from his beliefs about religion or working backwards from his beliefs about the role of government, Ben is constructing a false narrative, also known as lying, about the facts in order to validate and justify his beliefs, his feelings. Unfortunately for Ben, it turns out that facts have a liberal bias, and Ben's deceit is nothing new. For decades, what we now call think tanks had a largely nonpartisan goal of gathering data to assist lawmakers. In the 1970s, when conservatives realized that this objective data suggested that progressive policies would be best suited to address the main issues affecting the American people, conservatives decided to fundamentally change this dynamic by instead of using data to inform their policies, having the think tanks they support work backwards from their preferred policies by distorting the facts in order to support their ideological positions. This is why, right now, the GOP has had so much trouble getting their sh** together to make sure that people don't starve or become homeless because of a pandemic. Because they are ideologically opposed to the idea of the government helping people. Ben is nothing new. He spouts the same old talking points just on YouTube. Because if a government that does anything beyond protecting individual rights, as Ben states, is illegitimate, reparations are illegitimate. LBJ's war on poverty is illegitimate. Under Ben's ideology, any attempt by a democracy to alleviate the impact of overtly racist policies of the past or seek to achieve racial equality today are illegitimate. The data doesn't matter. The efficacy doesn't matter. The facts don't actually matter if the very idea of doing any of these things is illegitimate. Addressing racial inequality is entirely incompatible with Ben's ideology. So why don't you just f***ing say that, man? Like, instead of lying about whether or not it's possible to achieve racial equality through investments in black communities, just say, say you're not actually interested in doing that. Just be honest, Ben, and admit that you don't actually care about achieving racial equality. Stop pretending. We see you, Ben. We see through your lies. We see through your deception and fallacies and equivocations. Just say it. Stop cosplaying as a figure that gives a f about equality. You don't. Your lies are obvious and easily debunked, so just admit it. Admit who you truly are. Deep down, it will set you free, Ben. Tell us the truth, Ben. Give in to your feelings. Fulfill your destiny. The, the truth is that what makes the Star Wars universe interesting uh, is, the, is the dark side of the Force. Well, I'm sorry, Ben but I choose the light side of the force. I choose love, not now! <sighs> also, um, uh, wear, wear a mask. Wowee, that episode's over. Wasn't it an episode of the show? Thanks for watching, and like and subscribe, uh, Ben, who I'm speaking directly to. And, uh, you know, we've got a Patreon, uh, some more news. We've got another podcast called Even More News you can check out. We've got so many links in the description and so many other things to talk about in the future. Ben, who is you? All right, see ya.